If you think that you have done or committed some sin that is far too great for God to forgive you, let me tell you, you are wrong. Everyone, he wants everyone to be saved. Hi guys, welcome back. This is Journaling with Jesus, if you're new here. Welcome, my name is Michelle. For those of you who want to come to Christ today, I have included a salvation prayer at the end of this video. So I'd like to say a quick prayer to open us up here. Father God, we invite your Holy Spirit into fellowship with us today. I ask that your Holy Spirit take over and lead me in the words that I use to reach your people today. Help me to also reach out to the unbelievers, inviting them into fellowship with us. Help me to show them how much you love them and have always loved them since before they were even born. Help me to teach them how easy their salvation can be through the simple act of accepting your truth and the gift of your grace that was given and paid for by the willing sacrifice of your only begotten son. Thank you, Father God, for allowing us the opportunity for salvation through his sacrifice once and for all to cleanse us of all of our sins. We humbly come before you today to worship him as we praise, honor, and glorify him for his extraordinary sacrifice. Thank you, Lord Jesus, our high priest and king. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go over some questions here because a really good question to ask ourselves is, do we think that we're good? Um, do we think we're going to heaven or hell? Even though we're not under the old covenant law anymore, God still wants us to live righteously, right? So he, he gave these commandments to his children so that we can try to live righteously and do the right thing. I think he realized that, you know, those 613 rules that the Hebrews had to follow were, were pretty tough. They were all there in place like a father to a child to give rules to live by, to make your life easier, to make your life better, to keep you safe, all of those sorts of things. But with 613 rules, it's pretty impossible not to break one. Most people are pretty aware of the Ten Commandments. And the first four are about how to love God, and the last six are about how to love others. So we're gonna go over them really quick. So the Ten Commandments. Number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me, meaning don't love any other God besides the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So that means any idols. When Moses and the Israelites were at Mount Sinai, they made the golden calf and that really angered God. Um, and I believe it was 3,000 people died that day because of their sin to worship another God. God is a jealous God, and rightfully so. He created all of us. He created the angels. He created the demons. Demons are fallen angels. So I don't think that it's too much to ask that our Creator wants us to love Him in return. Thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number four, remember to keep the Sabbath, keep it holy. Number five, Honor thy father and mother. Number six, thou shalt not kill. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against a neighbor, meaning don't lie. Number 10, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house or wife. Don't want the things that other people have. Do you think you're a good person? I think I'm a good person. But at the same time, by these standards, if we want to live righteously, put on, you know, die to self and put on the righteousness of Christ, have the mind and body of Christ, we need to consider these things. We need to follow those, those rules, even though we are not under that covenant anymore. It's still a guidance to live by. So here's the heaven or hell quiz part. We need to ask ourselves some questions, right? Have you ever lied? I know I have. I'm guilty of that one. Have you ever disobeyed your parents or talked back to them? Guilty again. Have you ever stolen anything? Even if it was something simple, you know, when you were a child or, or taken anything that doesn't belong to you. I'm guilty of that one too. When I was a child, I didn't know any better and yeah, guilty. Have you ever had premarital sex or looked at someone in lust before? Someone that wasn't your spouse? Because the Bible says that if we Look at someone in lust, we commit adultery in our minds. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain, Uses, used the GD or the JC in anger? I'm guilty of that one too. How about church? Do you go to church every Sunday? 
Do you remember to take at least one day off and do no work in honor of the Lord, in remembrance of Him, spending time with Him? Up until recently, I didn't. So I'm guilty of that one too, of disobeying that one, not observing and, and recognizing and honoring the Sabbath. Have you ever wanted something that wasn't yours or, you know, wished that, you know, your neighbors got a boat and you wish you had a boat or wish you had their boat or wish you had their house? I mean, I'm guilty of that too. I see things that other people have and I want them. I'm guilty of those things too. So under those rules, I've broken. I've never had any other gods before God, so I haven't broken that one. I've never made an idol to, to my knowledge, but the Bible also says you can't have two masters. So for many, money is an idol. People worship money, just want more and more and more money. And the Bible says you can only have one master. You'll either love one and hate the other or hate one and love the other. By these rules, most people have sinned. So let's just kind of go off of the ones that most people have probably done, which is lying, stealing, taking the Lord's name in vain. So at the very minimum, I'm, I'm a lying thief who doesn't respect the Sabbath. I'm an adulterer because I've looked at other people in lust before. I am a fornicator. I've, I've had premarital sex and a blasphemer. Oh, and I've also coveted. So there's that. That's pretty significant. So as you can see, we are all sinners. Every single one of us. If you claim to think that you are not a sinner, that you are completely righteous, then you're probably a liar. So right there, you've sinned. First John chapter one, verses eight through nine. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. But here's the good news. God is patient. God is kind. He is loving. And he's just waiting for you to recognize your sins, turn from them, and come to him for forgiveness. It, it just goes to show you that that you know we're all sinners and we are all in need of a savior. Matthew chapter 9 verses 12 and 13. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So come to him. He's knocking at the door of your heart. Let him in. Soften your heart and let him in. Salvation can be yours. I'm just going to read through some Bible verses here. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jeremiah 1.5 I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. John chapter one, verses 16 through 17. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Romans. 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Romans 3, 23 through 24. For everyone have sinned. We all, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Okay, so God loves us all and wants us all to be saved. He's a very patient father. The enemy does not want you to know about God's promises. The enemy wants you far away from the Bible. But I am telling you, you've got to study the Bible because it is your salvation. The, the Bible is God, is the word of God. John, I think it's 1-1 one, one through about 1-5, talks about that the word is God. And, and in the beginning, it was with God. Jesus is the Word. He is the life. He is the only way to the Father. Come to Him. He's waiting. He's knocking at the door. Don't wait till it's too late. No one knows when they're going to take their last breath. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Isaiah 5, verse 20. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. He's waiting for us to come to him. He's waiting for us to turn from our sins and repent. He's waiting for us to come to him so that he can show us the way. We need to start admitting that we are sinners and we need a savior. Hebrews 11.1 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Hebrews 11.6 and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Romans 10 verses 9 through 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. John 3.3 3. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. John 15 verses 4 through 5. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and the gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. Revelation 3.20. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Matthew 11.28-30. through 30. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. It's never too late. Even, even the sinner that was on the cross next to Jesus in the last moments called out to him and was saved. He said, today we'll be together in paradise. So even then it wasn't too late. There are lots of examples of God's grace and God's patience and God's willingness to forgive you. All you have to do is come to him, call out to him, let him know that you want to surrender your life to him. That's all you need to do. It is so simple. When the Bible talks about fear, it's not necessarily like fear in a traditional sense, like, um, I don't know, being scared from watching a horror movie or something like that. It's awe and reverence. It's a deep respect, knowing that, that if you don't follow the right path, you're going to die the second death, the eternal death. I, for one, am not willing to have gold and riches and fame in this life, which is a blip on the radar screen compared to eternity. I want to live righteously here so that the Father knows that I want to be with him in heaven, so that he knows that I love him enough to say no to my flesh, to tell tell my flesh no, to, to tell my thoughts that, that, you know, I shouldn't be having those thoughts. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. John 12 verses 25 through 26. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will also be. 
If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Joshua 24, 15. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Acts 16, verse 31. They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. Romans 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. If you think that you have done or committed some sin that is far too great for God to forgive you, let me tell you, you are wrong. Everyone. He wants everyone to be saved. And here are just a few examples. Ezekiel 33, 19. But if wicked people turn from their wickedness and do what is just and right, they will live. Here's the verse about the thief that was on the cross next to Jesus, who called out to him in the last moments before Jesus died. He was a sinner. He was, he, he was up there on the cross next to Jesus because he had committed sins. Luke 23, 42 through 43. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, guys, it says everyone. And the, the good news is, is that the truth is so easy. It is so easy to receive salvation. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ. All you have to do is accept the fact that when he died for you on the cross, he took away all of your sins, all of your transgressions, all of your illness, everything. He took it all upon himself. On the third day, he defeated death and was raised by the Father from death. He defeated death so that you don't have to die, so that you can live eternally in heaven with him. Claim your prize, claim your crown. It's yours. All you have to do is believe in him, have faith in him. Admit that you are a sinner, repent of those sins and turn from them. Live a better life, live a righteous life. Do the right thing. You know in your heart right from wrong. Just do the right thing. Listen to that still small voice inside of you. That's God. That's the Holy Spirit trying to guide you. Listen. I would just like to say a quick little salvation prayer. Please don't skip the prayer. It's really important. I want to say a quick salvation prayer for anyone who wants to come to Jesus. This is for you. Okay, so please bow your heads and pray with me. I'd like you to say, please, Father God, I am tired of trying to do this life my way. I have stumbled and struggled. I am weak weary and worn. I need your help. I need you to guide me so that I can avoid the traps that this life has set to steal away my soul and my inheritance. I need you, Father God, to take over in my life. Please help set me upright on your path. Let me walk in your will. Help me to be more like your perfect son whom you sent to this earth to be sacrificed for my salvation. I pray, Father God, that if there is any yoke that is not your yoke, let that be broken off of me. Let me be free from any evil spirit or curse that is set to bind me. Lead me, guide me, live inside me. Lead me into your perfect grace and rest. Help me to see the error of my ways through your gentle correction and wisdom so that I can easily begin to drift away from the things in this earthly life that are holding me back from my heavenly inheritance. Father God, please forgive me for all of my sins, past, present, and future, known and unknown. For on this day, I declare, I believe in the finished work of your son, Yeshua who was tortured and died, nailed to a tree to cleanse me of all of my sins and transgressions. Father, I believe that on the third day you rose him from death. He ascended into heaven and is now and forevermore seated at your right hand. Thank you, Father God, for sending your beloved and only begotten Son to die in my place for my sins. With this prayer, I bring praise, honor, and glory to him. 
with remembrance, reverence, and awe. I am eternally grateful for his sacrifice, which he gladly paid on my behalf so that I could have the chance at forgiveness and salvation solely through my faith in what he did for me when he died for me. Thank you. In the mighty name of Yeshua, my King and Savior, I humbly pray. Amen. Well, that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I love you, family in Christ. Until next time, see you later. If you like this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. It really helps us grow. Subscribe, share, and turn on the bell notification. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and thanks for sharing. Your support means the world to us. Until next time, never stop learning to grow wherever you're presently planted.